It was tense in Tel Aviv on May the 14th, 1948. It was a day of which all future Jewish generations would never cease to speak and dream, the day of Israel's birth. Many leaders of Palestine Jewry had been hesitant about proclaiming independence. Some feared that such a spectacular act might provoke war with uncertain consequence, but Ben Gurion convened the leaders who decided by six against four to declare independence come what may. In a last minute plea to avert war, Golda Meyerson met with King Abdullah of Transjordan, who turned her down, warning that he will join Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon in their invasion if a Jewish state is proclaimed. David Ben-Gurion made an energetic entry and declaimed the proclamation on the rise of Israel in a firm and confident voice. There was a sense of high occasion. The applause was fervent. In the uh, modern history of Israel, we've uh, lived a kind of a process of fluctuation, uh, passing from a mood of uh, celebration uh, to moods of deep anxiety. We established our independence by the declaration of the uh, 14th of May, 1948. But before our celebration had died down, before the noise of festivity had subsided, there was a bombing of uh, Israel the next morning by Egypt, and Arab forces began to converge upon us. The Arab aim was the extinction of Israel. They would mock the very idea that a Jewish state could arise against the Arab will. Israel, less than one day old, was being attacked not by untrained volunteers, but by the armies of six sovereign Arab states, well-trained and lavishly equipped with British and French weaponry. The combined Arab armies had 35,000 men with modern armor and artillery. The Jewish army, men, women, and high school students who face the Arab onslaught are mainly civilians, poorly equipped, barely trained, using faith and determination against overwhelming odds. Our forces were now engaged on three fronts, in the north against the Syrians and Lebanese, in the center against the Iraqi army and the Transjordanian Arab Legion, and in the south against the formidable Egyptians. But Jerusalem was our greatest source of danger. On May the 18th, the Arab Legion had launched its assault on Jerusalem. It penetrated the old city, a knife thrust at Israel's heart. The fighting was house to house and hand to hand. When the state was declared, I was not on the convoy. I commanded a brigade that fought in the besieged Jerusalem. It was a very bit of fighting. The brigade that I commanded suffered the highest number of casualties than any one of the other 12 brigades of the armed forces of Israel of the IDF. I didn't think about the meaning of the state. I was completely preoccupied in the fighting in the besieged Jerusalem to prevent the annihilation of 80,000 Jews that were under the siege thirsty for water, starving for food, shelled, fired at by snipers. This was what I thought about. Not what would happen with the state later on. Then we fought for our survival in the real meaning of the word. The uh, teenagers, between the ages of 12 and 14, were recruited to the Gadna, to the farm military service, and they performed functions of messengers carrying notes, and carrying uh, ammunition. Some of them were hurt, were wounded, severely wounded. One of them uh, lost uh, his leg. They not only showed the bravery, they were actually better functioning than any grown-up could do. 
On May the 28th, in Jerusalem, with only 300 rounds of ammunition left and only 36 fighting men still in action, the defenders of the old city had to surrender. Arabs looted the Jewish quarter, destroying dozens of synagogues in their wild rampage. Fewer than 1,200 civilians made their sad, weary way down the slopes of Mount Zion. Their wounds were tended. West of Jerusalem fought on with valor against the Arab Legion, whose morale was now high. Its Jewish population was besieged, threatened with famine and thirst, isolated from the main body of the state, and subjected to an inferno of bombardment day and night. When Jerusalem was under siege, we had reached a point which uh, one of our commanders at that time, uh, General Herzog, has uh, portrayed. Its water supplies had been cut off and it was living only on what had been collected in the water cisterns. Uh, everybody was living on one pail of water a day for all purposes and about three slices of bread a day. That's all that was left in the city at the time. It would be impossible to bring water, food or ammunition into Jerusalem unless the heights commanding the approaches to the city from the coast could be captured by the Palmach troops. The Palmach attacked Castel across seemingly impassable hills and rocks. Ben Gurion was implacable in demanding this costly effort. It was decided to try to seize Latrun, formerly a British police stronghold where the Arab Legion was entrenched. We were thrown into battle at Latrun in order to try to open the road to Jerusalem. Even though the forces in which I personally participated, such as the 7th Brigade, were not ready to go into battle. They had not been trained, they didn't know each other. Some of them had just come off the boats as immigrants from Cyprus. Uh, I don't know if they really knew how to handle a rifle or not. These untrained troops were thrown into the inferno, attacking, retreating, attacking again and again. Despite their gallantry in carrying out a difficult order, they failed to break through. After the fall of the old city, Israel had to absorb another defeat. We didn't succeed. Ben-Gurion was very heavily criticized for this decision. But while Jerusalem was our main anxiety, we were heavily engaged in resisting dangerous enemy pressures in the north and in the south. In the north, the focus of our disquiet was Daganya, known as the mother of the kibbutz movement, founded in 1910. It was a powerful symbol for all Israelis. The Syrians had attacked at dawn on May the 20th with heavy artillery fire. Syrian tanks broke through Daganya's defenses and were set afire by Molotov cocktails thrown by the kibbutzniks at short range. For four days, the farmers of Kibbutz de Ganya fought repeated Syrian armored attacks, destroyed tanks using Molotov cocktails, and hold the northern front. While de Ganya and Jerusalem were in deadly hazard, there was a third point of peril in the south. The Egyptians were advancing relentlessly along the coast, their proximity to Tel Aviv was alarming. On May the 19th, the Egyptian army had reached the tiny kibbutz of Yad Mordechai. It was reluctantly decided to remove the women and children to safety. There were four separate assaults by the Egyptians in a single day. The Arab aim was the extinction of Israel. In his first speech in the Security Council, Abba Iban asserts Israel's independence. 
If the Arab states want peace with Israel, they can have it. If they want war, they can have that too. But whether they want peace or war, they can have it only with the independent, sovereign state of Israel. By May the 23rd, the defenders were running short of ammunition. They couldn't hold out. In the dawn of May the 24th, the survivors of Yad Mordechai left their ruined village. Because of the bravery of the settlers on the way, who did not ev evacuate, the Egyptians advanced very hesitantly. The Egyptians advanced nevertheless, and they reached the area of Isdud, which is today the site of the town of Ashdod. The Givati Brigade played a major 